tore it down, I rebuilt it. I give myself a task. You can bet your ass I fulfill it. Yeah, man, I'm talking about Willis, one of the realest. You watch any of my content? I watch your pulling the thread uh, episodes inconsistently, um, but often enough, I watch a lot of your Instagram reels. You've been on the property here three days, four days. I showed up Thursday evening. Yeah. What am I lacking here? What are you lacking here? Uh, someone who knows how to organize things. Yeah. Yeah. What else? What advice would you give me? I hire someone who really likes to organize things. It's you. I'm not moving to Tennessee, I'm moving to Oklahoma. No, I know. But that's, that's you. They're, I don't have another one of you. Yeah. Like, that's why I look at them. Because Go find they, another one of me. For real. Yeah, but, yeah. I'll never shop it. Personality type is INTJ, Enneagram 1. Just go go put that on the internet and, and find it. You will find someone who's like me. INTJ? Yeah, that's a Myers-Briggs personality test. 16 personality types. It's a free test on the internet. Can you message me that? INTJ. Only about 2% of INTJs are women. If you can find a female INTJ, they tend to be very, very detail oriented, organizational management, very type A. They're incredibly irritating to work with. I'm ridiculously annoying, uh, but I, I get shit done. Are you really annoying or people just don't want to execute? Oh, the second one. Just because it makes me feel better about myself. Because they're lazy. Yeah. I mean, we see that all the time. So what am I, like around the property and stuff, like what would you change? That's genuinely what I would change. It's all fucked like, up. Give Air, me like two weeks in your shop and I, I would be incredibly happy because I would just like detail organize Would I have everything. to be involved in that? No. You would just come in here and I would leave and I'd come back and everything would be fixed. You would put an app on your phone, QR code scan everything, you just know where it is. What would that cost? I don't know. I'll find somebody. What would it cost to have you do it? I've not done anything at this scale. I have no idea. So this is really fucked up. No, this is just large. <laughs> I'm young, Sorry. and I have not been doing this very long. Sorry. How many of these have you done? Organizational jobs? I do one a month, but it's usually somebody's basement. I don't I do not do I, mean, we could I just, don't do many openings for we it. We could start with a 20, 20 by area, which is my workspace. Sure. Rough, that's a bug of some sort. If it doesn't bite you, don't worry about it. What, like, what do you think that would cost? Like that area where your security cameras are? Yeah. She's like, that's the worst. It is the worst. <laughs> Here's what happens. When I go in there to find something that I know is there, I don't find it. So after about five minutes, I'm like, this is costing me too much. So I buy a new one. Yeah. When they come in, I use the one I need, but I always buy five more so that I have them. Mm -hmm. And they sit on that table out there. Mm -hmm. Every time we do an event, somebody, usually not me, puts all that shit in there, and then I never unpack it. Mm -hmm. And I walk more and more sideways. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, we get a new building, and I walk out of this building and leave all the shit here, and we go into the new building and have all new shit. And you've already done this at least once. No, more than once. Yeah. You have another building in Tennessee, right? Yeah. Did you, did you do you you've so you've done that more than once in Tennessee? Mm, kind of. It all got compressed. Yeah, but yeah, we had. Okay. Yep. Uh, probably like eight hundred dollars a day, and I probably spent at least three days in there. You want me to cash app you that right now, or how do you want? Mm -hmm. to I'm staying for three days. Hmm. I've heard that before. I'm going home to Wisconsin. I got a house to pack, and I got to move to Oklahoma. Show me back. I'll, I'll be back in October. They always come back. What movie was that? <laughs> So, what do you want to talk about? Uh, well, where'd you mess up in your business? <laughs> I mess up every day. Where'd you mess up in your business that you learned the most? You look back and you're like, that was a learning moment for me. I changed how I behaved. I changed how I thought. I don't in learn. That I don't learn. I keep making the same mistakes. I just make enough money to keep doing them. Is, is that not... He, what would what, what would you say? You'll get your answer. Mm. You got to talk more about you. Okay. I'm Tell to, like what you do. And this is more. I'm very intrigued. Like you walked in, and, and I could just tell immediately. Like this is going to be a cool conversation. You you got to talk more about what you do and bring him into it, and then you'll get that answer. Because you can't just 
He's never made a mistake because he's still here. Right? Yeah. At least that's how he views it. Could he be farther along? Yeah. Could he be farther behind? Yeah. It's more important for me to be friends with TJ than to do business with him because I'll fuck it up and we won't be friends. Hmm. That's why I don't do business with TJ. Why do you think you mess up with people and you do business with them? Because I'm a poor businessman. Then how do you make so much money? I just, I don't know. 30, 45 years maybe? Generally with business, the I am not a good, money. I am not a good people handler. Okay. I'm not a good manager. You lose employees a lot? I fire employees a lot. I keep the good ones. I have people on my floor that have been here 18 years. Okay. I have no ability for dealing with mediocre people. Are you HR? Yeah, my HR step in my office. Hey, come here a second. You fired again. Okay. The difference between I heard Harmo. You know who Alex Harmozy is? Yeah. You've heard Bear talk about this. I send all that shit to Bear too. Yeah. And he spoke about that, and he said, you know, the difference between a a really big successful business and a small business is the ability to tolerate mediocrity. And I, I took it a bit further, and it's because I'm still involved in my business, and the best thing for my business would be for me to not run my business. Because I am involved, I know that when I am paying somebody to do a task, I know what that task should take, and because I'm involved, whereas if I had a manager, it's not their money, and they would allow those things to happen, and we would retain those employees, right? It takes three mediocre employees to make one all-star, and most people aren't all-stars. It's the, what is it, Pareto principle? 20% of the people do 80% of the work? Yeah, narrowing things down. Do you think that's true? Yeah. I think it's probably less. Especially as a business owner, right? Less percent of people. Have you employed. have you ever been an employee? Yeah. Are you a good employee? I was a good employee before I realized that I didn't have to be an employee. I think if I were to go back into a situation where I had a direct boss, I would be a much worse employee. Mm -hmm. Especially having tasted freedom. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I'll latch onto a project and I want to do the project. Like, that was one of the things that was the most freeing after I left my last job. I worked in an office for years, like, cubicle, desk, this is your computer, stay here. And one of the most irritating things about that job was I would have these, these projects set and they were like, do this thing, you have the flexibility to do it how you want because we know you're going to execute, but you have to leave at five like get out of the building and then you have to come back and start over at eight and you get that momentum rolling on a project and then you get it cut off. That's really irritating because it's hard to, the object in motion tends to stay in motion, right? It's hard to get that momentum, that motivation, that movement back the next morning at eight o'clock when you're allowed to clock in. But working for yourself, like working for myself, I get rolling on a project and most of the time I'm working in empty houses. Like I'm finishing spec builds or we're putting in flooring, like people aren't there and so if we're rolling on a project and I'm still there and it's 10, 11, midnight, nobody cares. Like, I brought my lighting system. I've got a podcast. Half the time I've got my dog. I'm good. Like, leave me alone. Let me finish this. You're doing the wrong shit. You should be doing this. Holy shit. Like, she should be... I should be doing what? This. Business information. This is what you should be doing. I think I want to get into it long term, but it's also, like, people here... It's been really cool. I've taken me fairly seriously because I can show up and I can present myself with some level of authority. I've been public speaking. Like public speaking doesn't bother me and a lot of people are really afraid of it. So when you run into someone who's not afraid of it, I feel like you get you get that leg up right away. But I'm I'm also twenty six. Like I'd really like to put more years under my belt of actually successfully running I never a business. Thought about how old you are. Like it never even crossed my mind. How old is she? But like, who's the ch who's the chick that's super viral right now? Corey something. She was on Dropping Bombs. She's been on everybody's show. She does all the business advice about buying businesses. Like that's the total. Like, you should be doing this. Like, and I don't know who you have to prove yourself to. Like, if you're taken pretty seriously. Like, I don't know how somebody couldn't take you seriously. You walk in like you fucking own the place. But for real, right? What do I need to do? What do you need me to do? Yeah. Like look in the eyes like like you're different like you are not like and maybe it's that thing you said whatever that was but with that thing look up what INTJ oh yeah my brains no that's just ownership so personality types will tell you kind of core your bent like what direction you are inclined to go or and honestly a huge part of like the Enneagram or Myers-Briggs to tell you what you're bad at, which is a good thing to know. Like, How long does it take to take that test? 
Myers Briggs, maybe 10, 12 minutes. Enneagram is, it can be tested, but really, there's a book I can recommend to you. I'm never going to read it. Ne- will you listen to it? You listen to audiobooks? I would. I will. Yeah, you can get what you need out of listening to it. It's a self diagnosed. What do you think it's going to say about me? The, I, the real end. Don't worry about hurting. I don't think you're worried no, about hurting my feelings. I'm not. I just don't know you super well. Um, I, I'm going to guess that you are an eight, an Enneagram eight. A heavy, it's a heavy hitting personality type. Uh, no bullshit. Uh, you're usually latch onto something and, and run with it. Like that's your thing and you're not going to let it go. Um, your downsides are, you're probably me. But I'm not intentionally me. No, they never Did you are. you listen to me speak out here? Yeah. Was I mean? No, you're, I see you as direct, but I also don't get offended. These dudes, easily. when I got off stage said, man, that was pretty fucking spicy. They've never said that. So I figured. Mean is a spectrum though. Like mean is determined by how easy you are to offend. Like, if I think you're mean, are you actually mean or am I just offendable? And are you living life unoffendably? My authenticity is worth more than your sensitivity. Exactly. So, I, I'm going to guess that you're an eight. What's the scale go to? It's, it's, the types are one through nine. There's not a, like, hierarchy to them at all. It's a circle. I'm a one. Ones are detail-oriented. I, they tend to lean obsessive so you're a one and i'm an eight it's a circle john it's not a hierarchy (laughs) no i wasn't saying that like you get shit done and you're a one i get shit done you make shit happen i need three of you probably oh google it i don't know i'm not moving here i'm not trying to get you (laughs) i know what you're doing yeah what's your husband he is seven so it tends to be more free spirited. Is that why you guys work? Yes. Yeah, we are the epitome of balancing each other out. I would lose my mind without him. But that's why you mesh because you are opposites. He calms me down and I get him moving. Got it. You the organization? Yeah. And he's the muscle. Absolutely. I try to keep up. I have to work twice as hard to have you always were you in shape when you were working a cubicle job? Yeah. But I, that was my sanity. I'd get off work and go to the gym. Um, I worked with a trainer pretty much full time while I was, while I was working there because I needed to burn it off, which is a huge part of why I left because that got shut down in 2020. What type of job was that? I, it was customer service. Honestly, they called it customer relations. I worked in animal welfare, so people got really nasty during the pandemic. People were nasty to begin with. People get really sensitive about their animals, which is fair. I do too. Um, but when you don't have face-to-face interactions with people for months, and, and our area got shut down pretty hard, you get a lot. What is animal welfare? I worked at a humane society, but we also, like, I was the dispatcher for animal control oh. as well. So, yeah, it's, it was burnout. Basically, my entire department left when I did. They replaced us with other people that weren't burned out. Got it. It was a good leave. But it was also a good learning opportunity. Learn what you don't want. So did you know you were going to Oklahoma before you went to Oklahoma? You've been there, right? Twice. Did you know that was where you were going before you saw it? So, can I back up a little bit on that story? You can do whatever you want to do. Okay. So, Logan and I came to... Self-Reliance Spring 23, so the March one. Uh, And a huge part of us coming was we wanted to meet the Bear Independent team. And we wanted to see if they were who they said they were. Um, They got deployed on the Mississippi tornado the second day here. But I spent, we came early. I try to volunteer for any event that I go to because it gives you access. It gives you access to the people who are running, gives you the access to the people who are speaking. You can usually show up early. You can usually stay late. It's worth all of the effort that I put into any event I go to. And I was sitting on the table that you have next to your front door. With the lady there. Uh, you've got statues. Well, I know what you're talking about. I'm just curious what time. Go ahead. I'm 
sorry. Yeah. So uh, Bear was sitting at your picnic table and he was having, yeah, it was some sort of debate discussion with this woman, but there was like six other yeah, people sitting at the, at the picnic table too. And I was just listening to him so like settled, like he, he was comfortable having this rather intense discussion. I don't even remember what it was about. She's a witch. With this person who was going after him. I'm like, man, this man's really got both feet on the ground. Like, he's not getting phased by this. He's not rattled. And then they up and left for Mississippi, like, at 5 in the morning. And I watched their YouTube content come out over the next several days as they documented the tornado recovery and what they were doing in Mississippi. I was watching the news stuff coming out of there. And, like, man, these people really, they really love people. In, in an authentic, like, hands-on way. Because that's how I love people. I'm not good at, like, sitting across the table and telling you, everything's going to be okay, and I'm going to listen to your feelings. Like, I don't care. But if I can love my people by showing up to fix the thing that's broken, clean your house. Like, I'm not going to come hold your baby, but I'll come do your laundry. Um, that's, like, that's tangible to me. I understand that. I know how to execute on that. And so that was really cool to watch them do that. And um, Logan and I decided to sign up for Grindstone just on the off chance that we would have the availability for a deployment. It's not something that's likely just because we don't leave job sites. Like you don't leave here. We're not gonna ditch out on something that we've committed to doing. So unless we had a break in work or could work around it, it would be difficult. But we were like, what's it hurt to be on the mailing list? Um, and then we put in our applications for Caleb House because we knew that would take a little bit of time. The intention was that we would put in our applications, you have to fill out a background check, get our checks back, and then we'd be cleared to come and we had planned on going this summer. So summer of 24 to help with construction, just go volunteer for like three or four weeks. We were planning on blocking off some time, uh, getting a camper and just going down there for a while. We got an email in, I think it was the last week of October, first week of November, somewhere in there, from one of the directors. And he said, you put in a really solid application. We are having a really hard time finding carpenters, like competent people who know how to work with wood, who actually want to show up for longer than like a day we need help right now, would you consider coming down? I responded to the email like, do you understand that I live 12 hours away? When does this show up? Like, when does it actually need to start? And are you actually ready to put this thing up? Because what I find with people who don't know construction is they say they're ready and they're they're like so far from ready. Um, he was able to verify like, no, the site is actually somewhat prepared. This is when the lumber is being dropped off. This is kind of our thought process. And yes, I understand you live 12 hours away. And uh, we hopped on a phone call and he picked up the phone and I was like, I just want to make sure you're a real person before I spend an entire day in the car. It's like, cool, I'm a real person. Are you going to spend an entire day in the car? And we went over Thanksgiving week. Um, so we were there for, I don't know, seven, eight, nine days over Thanksgiving. And we were able to put boots on the ground with Caleb House and just fell in love with the mission, with the property, with the people. Um, it is shockingly difficult to find people who are who they say they are day in and day out, who, who don't have emotional meltdowns or go off the rails for what they're saying or act one way on a camera and act a different way off. Um, and everyone that we encountered there was like, no, this is really who you are. And so right before we got in the car to go down there, I, we were sitting in the kitchen and I turned to Logan and I said, you do know that if we get in the car to go, this is going to change our whole lives. And he said, yeah, I know, but we got to get in the car. And so I think we both knew before we left, but it's a matter of like, you've you got to go and make sure that you know. Because uh, that's a huge relocation for both of us. Logan's third generation in our area. Um, my family's there. Like, we're very close to our families. And 
they're they're both all of them are sad to see us go but none of them are unsupportive which is a really good thing because there's there's a few of them that could have been unsupportive and it would have been more difficult but not one of them has did has you expect it from them. those um i was hopeful that we wouldn't see it mm -hmm. so yeah and then we went back in march for the ruckus uh we went like a week and a half early um property shopped and found a, a really great property um got an accepted offer so now we just need to sell our house how much property did you get 42 acres that's awesome yeah backs up to a river it's beautiful i'm like so in awe that we get to actually live on land my i joke that my homestead is measured in feet not acres because it's a city lot so when you got there did they know where property was to go hey go look at this or did you have mm -hmm. to locate the property i locate i hired a realtor got it. i was like here's my list from zillow please make this happen tell me what day i'm coming to look at stuff and she's like got it all lined up on monday we start at nine and you're getting raw land Mm -mm. No, there's a house on it. There's multiple buildings. Some of them are coming down because they're kind of... I, I bought a retired marijuana grow operation, so there's plenty of stuff there. Soil's probably fertile. Yeah, and there's like three greenhouses and cisterns, and I wrote in the offer, like, as is, don't touch the stuff. Took video of all of it, like all the IBC totes and pump systems, and it's pretty sweet. So I'm excited to get infrastructure spun up and awesome start growing things and yeah we were very curious as to what bear was i found him probably 2019 beginning of the covid stuff yeah watched him days every day everything we put out watched it and just i never even interacted with him yeah and then when the tornado happened in kentucky i'm like holy shit that's close mm -hmm. so we loaded up everything we could put in the truck went up to donate so that kind of got us there and then just i wanted to see what it really was if that's what it was and it was it was 100 percent everything that it's exactly how it is and there's not anything different and we've he's been here multiple times we've done hours and hours of podcasting and we've spent even a hundred times more than that off camera and the conversations it's exactly the same same thing is that the last time you left the compound for more than a day no i, I leave but i always come back like i don't ever leave the state i don't go far you gonna come to the next ruckus i was coming to this ruckus i know i didn't see you yeah, I didn't. I didn't come. I had a good excuse. Okay, I don't I should, believe you. I should have gone. I uh, same. I know that if I leave, I'm not coming back. <clears throat> I'm not. I'm not ready for that. Yet. Yeah. When are you ready for a new building? Come visit. I'm gonna put in a guest house. It's the first building that's going up. Mostly because I really want to get rid of the house that's there. So. Is that yeah. the plan? Build a new one and then. I'll build a guest house, move into the guest house, build the real house, because of course they put the double wide trailer in the best view. Yeah. So the double wide has to go so I can build a permanent house. Will you just light that on fire or what are you doing? No, it's probably worth forty grand, so I'll sell it. It's cool. Yeah. Good good chunk of concrete money. You can pay someone else to do that. I hate doing concrete. So did you learn construction? Like you knew it or you learned it with the husband or I learned it with Logan. Yeah, Logan started in drywall at fourteen. Um, so he did 10 years in drywall. Um, you really can't learn anything more about drywall after about five years and he was getting bored. Uh, so we moved overseas for a while. Um, our first year of marriage, we lived in Australia for a bit. We were in Israel for a while, back to Australia. I uh, did a Bible school and then some ministry outreach, humanitarian stuff. Um, and then when we came back, he got a job with a custom framing company. And so he uh, he's five years in that now he builds like multi-million dollar golf course homes so he's got to learn a ton through that just trial by fire building it, their company's slogan is no problem like whatever the owner says yeah no problem we got that um which sometimes can be really discouraging like you spend an entire day building this ornate staircase and they're like yeah i really want the staircase on the other side of the house and then the next day you take down the staircase you built and you move it to the other side of the house because no problem. Um, but he's learned a ton there. Um, and in that process, we bought our house. It's a 1905 original four square and we are the fourth owners. Uh, so the original builder lived in it. And then it was purchased probably in the early twenties is our best guess. That family lived there. That was like a, a young couple 
Um, they lived there until into retirement and sold it to their granddaughter, and I bought it from her. Wow. Um, so nothing had been touched. Nothing had been remodeled since the 60s, probably, um, which means nothing had been ruined. Does he still work for that company? He he ended about a week ago. Wow. Yeah. So, so you guys were kind of doing your own thing on the weekends? I was doing it pretty much full time, and then he was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, yeah. Give or take what days were available. Holidays. We don't really do holidays. How's working together? I love it. And there's never an argument or not. Oh, we fight all the time. Yeah. It's good. Builds character. Yeah. Um, People ask us how we do it because my wife and I do a podcast every week. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm like, well, we just have a really big building. So yeah. it's kind of good. Well, and that's the thing too is like, I'm the administrator and I'm finance. So if it's money or email oriented, it's not him. It's never going to be him. Um, which means that I do have to spend time in the office, which we kind of delegate hours into like what's an income producing activity and what's not an income producing activity. Income producing activities are actual hours on the job site. I am billing someone directly for the work that I'm doing. Those hours need to then cover the time that I have to sit behind a desk and write up invoices and answer emails and send out bids and estimates and do takeoffs and that sort of thing. Um, He doesn't do the office side of things except for bidding and takeoffs. We do those together. He's a killer on the job site though. Like he'll come in and he handles all of our subcontractors. Um, He is he's doing head up for all the job sites and then I show up and I'm usually labor um, when I when I show up on things the exception being I have I do our whole like painting everything I do bids measurements billing and most of our painting would you rather do administrative or physical labor I like the balance of both I get bored really easily so if all I was doing was labor I think I, I would just wear out um, but if all I do is admin, I get I just get bored. So when you went to Australia and, and Israel, and mm-hmm. you went under one church? The church we went, you, or how did that work? No, we went with YWAM. Um, it's a global organization. They have mission bases in 170 countries, I think. They're, they're most countries that are accessible. And honestly, they're probably in the ones that aren't, and we just don't know about it. Um, we... We were figuring out how to be adults and also figuring out how to be married at the same time. Um, I was 19, he was 22 when we got married, so we had a lot of figuring out to do. And we got really frustrated with where we were at in life, and I looked at a globe and was like, what's the furthest away I can get from Wisconsin? Um, and it's, it's the coast of Australia. I was like, great, how do I get there? And I googled it, and YWAM Brisbane came up. Um, and I, we sent in an application we're like, why not? Like, what's it, what's it going to hurt? It's really not that expensive. We want to get out of here. We need to be away from our families for a little while and create that distance of like, this is now our family. Um, and yeah, got on an airplane, spent five months backpacking across Australia, um, helping people, I doing can't... stuff. What does that look like? What do you... Everything from like deep cleaning churches to running children's programs to doing like VBS style sports at the park, grill outs. Um, We ran a festival for a week at one point. We did, we did team building training, which was honestly really hard. I'm just dumped with our backpacks in the middle of a state park and run through different drills and just things to, to build teams. Um, and then we also did educational stuff. So education on public speaking, um, on biblical studies, on m- ministry in a lot of different directions, um, children's ministry, music ministry, communicating when there's a language barrier was huge. So a lot of not only getting good at charades, but getting good at like communicating well through acting because that's a universal language. Um, and then that all gets applied. Outreach phase for YLM is your secondary location. And for us, that was Israel. It's 
different places for every school and it's not guaranteed you don't know where you're going when you show up at site one so when we went to australia we had no idea where our site two was going to be so lots of church in there uh yeah church church asterisk not church like traditional lots of bible yes lots of bible um yeah i would say not very much like church the way people think about it like walking to a building and then there's music and there's teaching and shake your neighbor's hand like there's very little of that it was a lot of do you love people where they are and then are you gonna help them like love themselves where they're at um and then get better because i'm a huge fan of the whole like love you where you're at meet you where you're at thing but i'm not a huge fan of leave you where you're at because i don't know a lot of people that are happy with exactly where they are if they actually ask themselves that um, outreach in israel was intense Israel is an intense country when it's not at war um, and we were on the forward edge of them deciding that maybe that was a good idea so and we were there over Christmas which is a highly contested time in that region um, so you get you get a lot of different denominations of church that want different days and different sites and things are holier one place than another which is here nor there whether you believe that but do you believe that that certain areas are more holy not really um i think that certain things can have spiritual feelings attached to them um could a person feel those and not knowing what it was and yeah and it, i've seen people then it's real right? happen yeah i don't know that there necessarily needs to be a religious attachment to that though um because I've, I've felt stuff like that in places that people wouldn't call holy or special. Um, but very interesting to watch in different sects of Christianity, different denominations, basically just butt heads over whether or not this church or that church was the place they needed to be for Christmas. Um, there was a There was a terrorist attack on Christmas while we were there, so we got locked down for about 48 hours uh there's a border checkpoint no one likes border checkpoints um so that was that was fun we didn't have power for a couple days and we couldn't leave um but it was a good pressure test you know what hey, are you gonna do with this yourself is, this is in israel that's all in israel. why was there no power for a couple of days i don't know it's just how that area just turn is it off or? yeah could have been the attack could have been someone didn't like that light post where it was could have been someone it's it's a little bit chaotic it's a lot of bit chaotic um we spent a good chunk of time in the west bank so. did you grow up in the church yeah so you've always gone to church uh yeah up until about three or four years ago i had a really hard time going back to traditional church after we moved home from, from israel was your husband also he grew up in a church also mm -hmm. different kind of church but yeah so would you consider what denomination would you consider yourself in? I don't. Got it. Yeah, so, that was a that was a huge part of what made it hard to go back. Was watching all of those denominations clash and then coming back and realizing that all that really mattered to us was what the Bible said. And if it doesn't say it then why are we telling other people it from the stage? When the reality is like love God, love people, move your feet. Did you always follow the Torah? Mm mm. We I wouldn't say that we're Torah now. I Torah questioning maybe Torah curious I think is what some people would call it. Um, I think there's I think there's a lot to be said about it. I test a lot of things against science. Like, do they if, test out? Yeah. Like, if God is real and God created all of this, and then He wrote down this set of laws, then technically this set of laws needs to be able to be backed by by the data that I can create. Like, why would you say that if it's not actually going to hurt me? So how is it going to hurt me then? Or or how is it bad for me? And, and you start running down that rabbit trail on different things and you realize that the things that he says not to do do actually cause damage. Psychologically, physically, he's, he's actively trying to protect you from something. And a lot of what I found, like a lot of the 
you call it Torah, like cleansing laws, like cleanliness laws, take this outside the gate, wash your hands after you do this, you're unclean after X, is really just germ science. You can't explain to someone who, who has, who will never understand what a microscope is, who can't see that at all, who has no data reference for that. You can't show them like, this is what bacteria is, but now we know. Like, he's just telling you, don't kill something, gut it and clean it, and then go eat without cleaning yourself. You're dirty. You're going to get sick. And when you look at it that way, it makes sense. Like... Do you eat pork? Not anymore. But you did? We did. There's a surprising parasitic load in a creature that has no lymphatic system. And I found that I feel a lot better when I don't. Yeah, same thing with rabbits. So no rabbits? Mm -mm. No shellfish? I'm allergic to shellfish. So no shellfish before that either. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. It's a, it's a road that we're nosing down slowly. Mm -hmm. So did you get any of that building built when you were there? Mm -hmm. yeah, we got a good chunk of it. There's a lot of site mapping. There was no blueprints, no plan. <laughs> the guy they got it from maybe should not have been designing construction plans, but it worked out fine. Um, we got the site map done. We got less than we wanted to, but more than they anticipated done. So that's good. Uh, we worked on it again when we were there in March. So, and they've been working on it since we've been gone. So we'll keep, keep checking on it once we get there. It's cool. Yeah, I'm excited. So how long until your house sells? I hope it sells like tomorrow. We had, I was checking camera systems. I think we had 10 or 12 families through it yesterday. Just because I'm gone, so I told our realtor to go nuts. It's cool. Yeah, I mean, it's beautiful. It's been gutted down to the studs. It's all, we've got new electrical from the pole. We did all of the plumbing. Um, took out probably 40,000 pounds of plaster, replaced it all with drywall and insulation. So it's been a huge labor of love, but it's been, really fun and, and that's circling back to construction that's where i learned a lot because you're allowed to mess up when it's your space and then say i hate that and do it again i'm on the third iteration of one of my bathrooms because i just keep deciding i don't like it you think you'll recoup all the labor that you put into it and then some <clears throat> well not if i was charging someone else but the fact that i'm getting paid back for what i put into it at all is i think good um, we work at the speed of cash when it's our projects, so we've put probably, we average it out at about 10 grand a year, so we put probably 50 grand into it, and I'll recover that over and over again. That's awesome. Yeah. So what's next? Uh, after the move, I think we're going to be in the house that's on property for a little while. We want to build out animal infrastructure first, um, fencing, I need shelters put in. Uh, we're getting these giant industrial chicken houses with the property, and I have absolutely no intention of running tens of thousands of chickens. I can't think of many things that... How big are those? They're 40 feet wide by 500 feet long, and oh, I've got shit. four of them. They do not have concrete floors, so I think they're tall. The doors are like 10 or 12 feet tall on the end, so they're perfectly usable like the ceilings are insulated it's sheet metal roofing um people pay to take them down because they're recyclable so i think we'll get rid of at least one of them and have someone pay us to take it off our property yeah it's a lot of dry storage it sounds like yeah and then i want to run concrete in the front of one so we have a really sealed up area put in storage i really want to put in a gym like just for fun um logan wants a woodworking shop so we'll definitely make that happen and then I don't know what we'll do with the rest of them. Um, play it by ear. Figure out how the land plays, like where water sits. I want to observe for a while, even before we put in any type of human infrastructure, like houses, guest houses, that sort of thing. Just because you can't see that in a couple two-hour visits. You can't see how it acts during storms. I'm, yeah, you can really see it multiple seasons. Yeah. Do you want to bring a permaculture guy in that? Are you just going to do all I'm, that? So Ferguson's been coaching someone down there. I'm going to bring him in, and then the next time Nick's in the area, I want to bring him over as well. Yeah, I heard Bear mention his name the other day. Nick's? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's been... He's just a really cool 
cool guy. He's just such a wealth of knowledge. Yeah, he's been here a bunch of times. He's done a little bit of site survey stuff here, and then he's been on to Bob's in Ohio and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, I want to put... he. I've listened to the talk that he gave at SRF twice now, because he gave a very similar one at the Ruckus. And he, he's got me sold on his trees, and I've already picked out where I'm putting hedgerows of, like, those willow trees and the, the different fodder trees, because I drilled him with a bunch of questions. He talks a lot about ruminant animals and, like, ruminants processing them. And he said that they're fine for non-ruminant animals, like, that horses will eat them. The yeah. rabbits eat them. Yeah, and, like, I mean, it sounds like a really logical option for something. Hay is hard to come by where I'm from. And hay is expensive. Yeah, hard. the old timers call it tree hay. I mean, yeah. same thing. I mean, you've heard his presentations. Yeah. Or you can make it into silage. You can direct cut it, feed it, or you can make it into silage and then store it for you know, upwards of 24 months, 18 to 24. Yeah, I've never made silage, but I want to I want to play with it. We'll see what wins the time priority race, because mm -hmm. I tend to fill that up and not say no. Uh, so certain things will have to take priority over others, but that is something I'd like to play with eventually. Awesome. I want to do rabbits for sustainable dog food mm -hmm. at some point. Yeah, we feed rabbits to dogs. And the manure. <laughs> no, we don't feed the manure to the dogs. We use the manure because we can put it on all of the raised beds. All of this stuff, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's the matter of like, what do you do first and what do you do next? And then what do you allow to take your time? Yeah. It's, I think I've heard you say like, you don't do automated systems because you want to lay hands and eyes on things every day? I don't do true? automated systems because I'm lazy and if, it, if I know I have three days of water, it's easy for me to not go out there on the fourth. Mm. And if you have a clog or something like that and I'm not out there all three days, because we were growing rats, we were doing hundreds of rats every week for reptiles. I had thousands of snakes and it only takes a day when you have a leak and it floods and you have that whole tray of rats that are drowned. Mm. So if I have to be there every day, or twice a day even better, to make sure our water's topped off, then there's never a problem. Whereas if I'm not there for a day or two days, you will have everything drowned. And it's the same thing with the rabbits. If we have a problem with a rabbit, it's easy to take that rabbit out and do whatever we need to do with it versus infecting three or four other rabbits down the line or water or whatever it is. If we have a clog in a five-gallon bucket that's feeding a row of, you know, ten cages... We don't lose one rabbit, we lose all 10 rabbits if we don't see it. Yeah. So that's why. Do you hire people for that sort of thing? No, I'm terrible with that. I, I have people doing it, Yeah. but there's always something missed. And I had, I had a full-time reptile guy that worked for Chicago Zoo, and I had a reptile guy that was um, Nicholas Cage's snake. I came work for me full-time. When you're not taking, when you pay people to take care of the animals, and you don't go check on them for six weeks and you come back, you're missing animals always. No matter what you're paying them, if you're not overseeing those people, that people become complacent and you're paying that eight hours a day or whatever and you come in, if you're not overseeing it, the room's a mess, there's animals that are missing, there's water that's not filled. I just need better people, perhaps. But the other answer is if I go there every day, that complacency never happens and they know that it's going to be checked on. Because they know that you're going to follow up on them. Uh-huh. And it's only five minutes up the road. Your snake. Do you still have snakes? No, I don't. I, okay. We have the property. Everything's there. But it was only five minutes up the road. But it was super easy for me to not go to there not for go. weeks at a time. Yeah. Even being five minutes up the road. Yeah. When do you decide to hire someone versus just doing it if you have to oversee everything yourself anyway? I'm How do you make that decision? Well, that's why I'm not a, a multi-multi-million dollar company. Because I don't. Does Amanda make that decision? Does she have anything to do with personnel? No. She writes, the, she has checks. Sure. Yeah. She's your finance person. Yeah. She okay. pays the bills. Okay. Yeah. She doesn't tell you no? No, she can't tell me no. It's my, it's like, it's not our business. It's you. Yeah. Yeah. How is that transition going with her starting her thing? It's completely wrecking everything I'm doing. Yeah, because she's not paying attention to what you're doing? or because... because she's not doing enough. Our stuff works because we do it. Yep. So when we, to have her do what she does, I need three other people to do that stuff. You need three other people to, to replace, replace her. her. Yeah. And she 
doesn't have anything to do with personnel, so you can't find those people. Because she would be the best person to find someone to replace her. So what I find is if I sit in the building, mm -hmm. production is twice what it is the day I'm not in the building. Just sitting there. Yeah, whether she's there or not. Okay. So I have to be in there to get that. When we're out here doing a podcast Friday, for instance, mm -hmm. there's much less work done on Friday, even though the exact same people are in the building. The only thing missing is me and her. Because you're not staring at them. I'm not even staring, just being in the building. That's interesting. Would you say that's correct, having been here? Yeah. You worked for me. <clears throat> it's think, and, and it was terrible, wasn't it? I have my own views on this. We've talked to me and him extensively about it. Put it out. For um, about, put it out. I think John's biggest issue is that he's in Camden, Tennessee. And I've leaned on this for forever. Most impoverished town in Tennessee. He is. He runs at too high of a level to ever find somebody to run at his level. And uh, there's been great people come and go and work for John for a long extended time. Mm -hmm. um, I just think two, one of two things need to happen. He needs to move to a town or a place where... He can hire nothing but high-level people and, and and let them earn the responsibility from him, take it away from him, mm -hmm. or he needs to change in the sense of accepting mediocrity, then you can guess which one's going to happen. I don't know that either one is going to happen. Because I don't see him ever accepting mediocrity, but he said how many times that he's not leaving. It, we can talk about that later. Okay. <laughs> Where would where would I go? Yeah, where I, would you go? I, I just think his I mean if you just go on history and his previous business model, mm -hmm. he had a different kind of people that ran with him and worked with him it's back when he was California. Labor. Yeah, Mexican California. Labor, right? it came to. So I think a cultured labor, however whatever culture it is, right? It needs to be in an area where there's you're gonna find that culture. People that have um just more Whatever the word I'm looking for here is, it's like, you know, just want to work or happy working, enjoy working, right? Like, this is not really a, I mean, they, this is a blue collar town, but not like tighten your boots up every day and go to work, blue collar town. You know what, what I'm saying? The like, plan here is to feign injury long enough to get disability. Hmm. And then they pay disability, but when you actually start a second job, if you're on disability and you made more than $800 a week or a month or whatever, for instance, they'll take your disability away. Yeah. It's about keeping them in a very low income, and that is the re that like no bullshit. That's the retirement plan. Here. It's a terrible retirement plan. The dream job here is to work for the power plant or wildlife authority, and then the majority. That's why you have people that escape, right? It used to be the dream to go to Hollywood and be an actress or a movie star or mm -hmm. you know, musician, but it, military. We lose. They go to the military to get out of here. Sure. So that's going to go away probably soon. The military? The desire to go to the military. Oh, absolutely. Like, just to get out of somewhere. What do you think is going to be the replacement? For them? Mm, for people who want to get out of where they are. Yeah, I don't know. I think that you're close to not being able to get out of where you are. So unless you change your work ethic or change your, your attitude about where you're at, you're going to stay there. Well, I think they're going to let things get very difficult for people. They're already talking about lowering UBT and lowering welfare. I think that's going to cause a lot of violence. I think that's by design and intentional mm -hmm. to have us fighting amongst ourselves. If it gets explosive here in Camden, then will you leave? Or will you just it build won't, higher it fences? It won't be explosive here It Camden. won't? No. Not enough angry people? Yeah, not no. Where would he go? He's not going back to California. He's not going to the East Coast. Selfishly, I'd like him to move to Nashville. So I, could, so I could quit my job and go back to work for him again, because I think this time I could do it. We could do it together. Why aren't you in Camden? Uh, because I have no, des I have no desire to live here. We, I mean, the people listening could... Tell her. Tell her the real fucking reason, whatever that is. Well, well so you live I'm, in Nashville. Nashville's not very so far I moved to I moved to I moved to Tennessee because of John and James Yeager. Okay. I came to take a class. I met John. I knocked on the door. Two days later, we're standing in the back of his shop, and I said, I want to move. And if you know me, and I've said this story a thousand times, so I'll keep it short. Yeah. If you know me, I would never, like, Pierre moving out of Michigan has never happened. You moved from Michigan. Yeah. Okay, so, so at it, least you've defrosted at this point. Right. 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 I, I got my recent, my assimilation card, so yeah. so I'm a, I'm a proper southerner now. So, um, 
I was like done. We got in a fight with my girlfriend at the time, now wife, that like, go drive the truck back to Michigan, load whatever you need and come back. Okay. And I'll have a job and something else. And she goes, fuck you, I'm not living in Camden. Like, that's not happening. Hey, you're not moving. I'm in nursing. Yeah. So all the, the whole story, you can fill in the, the rest. To answer his question, I would like him to move to Nashville because I think there's a, the labor force there, right? I'd go in the opposite direction. I, right. He would, you think that there are higher caliber people who are willing to not be mediocre there? Oh, they're absolutely there. Yeah, 100%. I mean, you have... You have Population. To, I mean, there's just the... the the next county below Nashville is one of the top ten um, wealthiest counties in the country. Oh, him moving, right? We're talking about him moving We're in Nashville. About him moving in like high caliber people and finding high caliber people. I think to grow a big company like that, you have to you need a lot of things done, and the the more important thing is is just the, it just needs to get done. If one person does a whole lot at a really high level, or ten people do it at a mediocre level, as long as it gets done, the company will grow. He just won't accept somebody do doing something half-assed. Do for a while. Yeah. yeah. But it's like, but but he said it earlier when he was saying like, I know what this task needs to be done, mm -hmm. right? So like, if he needs if forty things need to be cleaned, and he goes and he times himself, and he did it in ten seconds, extrapolate, give him an extra minute, but just because they're not him, and that should be the... No, the, the, it's watch one, do one, teach one, right? So if right. I'm standing at the table and I do this task in one minute, and you stand there and you duplicate the task at one minute, and I stand there and do 100 in 100 minutes, and you do 100 in 100 minutes, then obviously the number is 100, is a minute, right? Yes. When I walk away, and two hours later come back and you don't have 100 done, there's obviously a problem yeah, if you're if you are exhibiting the ability to do something yes. at speed and then you decrease speed, yes. And if you want more money, you increase your speed and you increase your ability, and then we give you more money, right? So yeah. when I give you more money for that, and then all of a sudden you revert and you've done fifty in two hours, that's a fucking problem. Yeah, that's the the debate of like mediocrity and work ethic has been something that's been rolling around in my head for a little while because. In construction, scale is people. There is like X amount that I can do and I cannot do more of it, but there will always be work. There is always work. Part of the reason that we don't advertise digitally at all is because we are already capped. Um, and so the answer is charge more, which we have been sliding scale increase. Well, we've been increasing prices faster than I'm comfortable with, which is good. It's a growing point and that's a good thing. Um, but then the debate is also like, w when do you hire someone? And right now we're working with subcontractors, which is fine because then they're not my problem when I don't need them. But it's also inconsistency. It's which sub is available at what time and find like finding the point of scale is not easy. So if you're, tr if you're comfortable with the prices you're charging, you're probably not charging enough. Right. And generally said that you should actually double the price that you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. When you charge more, you get better clients. Better clients typically do not try to negotiate price. Speed is more important than the price, and they will try pay a lot more for the speed. Yeah. My answer when I call the dude when my septic tanks are full mm -hmm. at 8 o'clock on Saturday night is, I will pay you anything to come here. What is that cost? Mm -hmm. Or, hey, I'll pay you a thousand bucks to show up plus whatever you because I need it done right then. Yeah. And we can typically get that dude, but he never comes from here. No. He comes from Nashville in the middle and drives two hours, and we've already got the excavator out and we've dug the hole. I can't get a dude here to perform on a septic service. That's, that's, it's a small and, town issue. And when too. you start hiring employees, I wake up every morning, and the first thing in my head is who's not going to be, and I know it's going to be one of three, if not all three. I also know that my highest performing people are going to be here no matter what. How many people do you have in the building? We're around about 20 right now. Okay. And apparently I just hired one today that I don't okay. even have a position for. Like, I don't... We'll see if he I shows run, up on Monday. He'll, show, he'll fucking show up. 100% he will. Did you hear the conversation with him? Briefly, yeah. So, I run men and I run women. Mm -hmm. For every one man I have, I need three women. Do you run them in, like, different sections? Yeah, I don't teach guys how to sew. Okay. Anytime I've taught a dude how to sew, I've created competition. A guy comes in here, has an interest in the product. Mm -hmm. A woman comes in and she has an interest in the job and not marketing the product. Yeah. If I hire a dude, he there's never a dude that's come in where I've taught him to sew where he didn't not only start a company,
but steel materials or steel uh, files or information or intellectual property. Interesting. Would you say that? You, yeah, absolutely. So they're coming here to learn a thing to then go do their own thing? I don't know if they come here with that in mind, but it ends that it way. I, some of them absolutely come here with that in mind. Yeah. Sure. Because how else are they going to learn the thing? Right. Because, and, and you don't have to anymore. Like the answer to everything is on the internet. Like when yeah. I started this, there was no internet. Like you had to, I had to communicate you, with you through mail. Yeah. Like, or a phone occasionally. But I do find a lot of people that, that can't or don't learn that way. I have a really hard time learning something digitally that's done with my hands. Like with the construction thing, right? I, I had to do it. For like, sure. So I, I do get that allure of like, I'm going to come here and learn the thing. I think it's manipulative, but no, I it makes Yeah, sense. 100%. I, like I watched the, them build this house in a, in a time lapse in mm -hmm. 20 minutes. They've built this whole, you know, one room cabin or whatever. Yeah. But if you've never struck a nail. Yeah. Like you don't, you don't know what that is if you no. can, but I mean, and nowadays there's plenty of people like they used to give us nails and hammers as children to play with. Right. Mm -hmm and a tape measure and you you yeah. had a tool set as a kid that was your grandfather's old tool set it wasn't the fisher price thing yeah but that doesn't happen anymore so I, mm -hmm. I, I guess i could understand that but i mean i taught myself to sew just through trial and error i mean somebody came over and showed me a dude showed yeah. me this is how you sew yeah and was there five minutes left and my sewing machine ran out of thread mom's like ah oh, it's in your blood i i can tell you show you but she didn't know she had a home machine versus the industrial, the industrial. machine yeah. So he came back, showed me how to change the bobbin, and I, then I was able to kind of change the bobbin. And, mm -hmm. But, I mean, it, it took a few weeks. But, I mean, I built a few things the first day, but there was no yeah. internet. Yeah. It didn't exist. Like Just figuring out what looks good and then figuring out how to replicate what looks yeah. good and get what you want. Yeah, I spent it. multiple, I spent many years going around trying to get the original gear that I sold to these guys and give them newer gear. And they didn't want to give it back, oh, or they gave it back? No, no, we none have gear in the UDT sealed. We have gear that is 30 years old still. Sure. Years. That's awesome. But like my guys move here and many of them are running from something, right? We got guys yeah. that just show up unannounced from Alaska. Yeah. But those are those are our guys. We would still provide work or some in some manner mm -hmm. if society collapsed or whatever. But for every one of those to feed and justify paying them to do this task, it takes three people doing labor on the sewing machines. And your sewing machine people are women, so what are the guys doing? Cutting, doing doing whatever. Okay. Tracing, cutting, clipping, assembly. The the pre to the sewing. Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes and, sense. The, and the afterwards, you know. Shipping, clipping, assembling, putting the buckles on. Yep. As well as anything we need to do on the properties, any any other animal any, infrastructure development. Yeah. Yep. Homestead stuff. That makes sense. Power goes out tomorrow. I mean we're all gonna be farmers. Yeah. Three or four of our girls will show up and we'll circle the wagons and close the gates and Yep. Some of them we'll never see again. Yeah. Most of them. I you gotta let me out though. Yeah. Okay. Because I got to go home. Well, you might not be able to get home with the Eclipse. Uh, Operation I, Bluebin, as soon as the, as soon as the spaceship gets I'm somewhat prepared to still go home if the Eclipse ends the world. Why do you think it's being promoted so crazily right now? I think people just really like to get spun up about stuff. Yep. And they, it, yeah, it's, it's amplified it's like, by social it's, media. It's a prepper porn thing, right? Like, we get so excited about, if the world's going to end, then I'm going to be X, Y, Z and do this cool thing and like... Dude, you haven't done it. It's like what, uh, what you were saying to the woman who was asking about how do you get home, right? How do you prepare to get home? I'm 800, 850 miles from home right now. I, I'm not going home. Like, the truth is, if something terrible happens and the world ends tomorrow, congratulations, I'm your next employee, and I'll organize your stock room. Um, but, but the execution of your answer was correct. Like, what do you need? Put it on your back and start walking. Like, I just started rucking in November. I think it was the first time I ever actually rucked. Like, put a substantial amount of weight on purpose on my back and went for a walk. I've backpacked for years. So I'm used to carrying, like, a full gear set. Like, this is how you're going to survive for the next week and walk into the woods type of thing. But my gear load out for that is a lot lower than my ruck load is. What was the rude awakening? Oh, I was just training for the rockets. No, but I mean, what did you learn from it? Like, what was the... I learned that I could carry a lot more than I thought I could. So it was I also learned that it hurts a lot more than I thought it was going to. Where? Uh, it pulls on my collarbone. Um, I think my back... I, 
I don't have a backpack that's designed for yeah, women. Yeah, I have a yeah. I have a men's backpack, which partially is height, um, and just finding something that stri- like is the correct length for my torso. Uh, but it's also just what I had, and it works fine for my thirty five pound backpacking loadout. It just is uncomfortable at sixty pounds. But it's an internal frame pack, so it's not designed for sixty pounds. So, five minutes back. Yep. What what advice do you have? What did you take from that? From from going to do the thing? For, no, from the employees and the, the the whole where would I go thing. I still think you're going to move at some point. From the employee aspect, I just really don't want to manage people, and I'm trying to figure out a way around managing people. So when you have employee for Sella, you know who MF CEO for yeah. Sella and all yep. that, right? He said something that I've repeated a thousand times. When you have to have proper employees or good employees, you have to pay them much more than they're actually should be paid. Yeah. So that when they're not going to come to work on Monday, they know that if it accumulates enough that you fire them, they're never going to have enough to another job that pays the amount you're paying them. You have to pay them more than they actually should be paid. Mm. He says worth. Sure. I don't know why I'm not just saying that because that's what I say. You should have to you, you should you have to pay them more than they're worth. Mm. How do you feel about people who decide how much they're worth without executing? Like who come in and say, "Well, I'm worth two hundred thousand a year," and you're like, "I have seen nothing from you." Like what what emotion does that bring up? What response does that bring up? Well, I don't have a conversation with those people. I mean, it doesn't just get off my so property. When, no, they they've never they'll never come here. Okay. If if they're worth two hundred thousand, they're not here. Um, I'm worth this, you're, and I say it all the time. I I know my worth is the thing you hear all the time, right? Yeah. I have no job, but I know my worth, and right. I'm not going to take this job doing this thing because he's holding out for an eighty thousand dollar a year job sure. or whatever. Well, you're only worth that if you can consistently make that. Yeah. When I say I'm a thousand dollars an hour, right? Can I consistently make a thousand? No, but I can consistently make five hundred mm-hmm. for a couple hours out of the day, right? Every day I can build a thing and sell it for a thousand dollars. Sure. Every single day. Yeah. Could I do that 10 times a day? Maybe not, right? So what are you consistently worth, right? If, if you say I'm worth $365,000 a year, mm-hmm. well then you're making $1,000 a day. Mm-hmm. And you can do, but you can show that, right? Mm-hmm. People saying that, they, they typically don't. Yeah, because that's the game we play. And we're talking, and there's a difference between that dude making 30 grand a month mm-hmm. and other people who say that, right? He's duplicated that. That's, you know, every, he can consistently do that over and over for multiple years. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's the, that's the game we play. We started playing when we started doing like the part-time construction thing. We we're like, okay, first it's gotta be hundred dollar days. Like we're working a couple hours. We need to bring in a hundred dollars a day and hundred dollar days were wins like gold sticker. You did a good job. And now it's thousand dollar days, mm-hmm. right? We're still doing this. I'm more full time. Logan's, he was full time for two days and then we left for Tennessee. But both of them were thousand dollar days because we're we've got time. We're executing and we're still able to do what we want to do, which is really the goal of working for ourselves. Like I can tell that you love what you do. You love being here. You I still I still sew every day. You wouldn't live on site if you didn't adore the life that you've built in some way. Uh, so do you know I went to federal prison? Yeah. Okay, so I was in federal prison. While I was in federal prison, I'm reading Mother Earth News and Backwoods Home Magazine. I'm How long were you? 22 months. Okay. 13 years. Okay. That's what they said. Yeah. I got 22 is what I did. Yeah. Um, but I'm reading all this stuff, and what, am I, like, what I'm reading is, like, Lewis Lamore books, and uh, prepper fiction didn't really exist. Yep. Um, and I'm, I'm reading anything I can on homestead, and I'm reading the Backwoods Home anthologies, and I'm just dreaming about a garden, and... What I'm picturing, I, I, and you pick the you pick the places that you want to go because you look at the lowest cost of the property, right? So mine was like St. James, Arizona, high desert, mm-hmm. no water, but we'll collect it off the roof. And you see these things like you can get a forty by sixty square foot building for yeah. ten thousand dollars, and I'm like, cool, I'll put a loft in there and have a twenty four hundred square foot apartment. Yeah. And it dawned on me, and that was twenty two years ago or so, right? But it dawned on me a couple of years ago that I did exactly that. Like I am in that building and yeah. we put the loft in the building mm-hmm. and I never thought about it while we were doing it. When we started building this building, never was the intention to even put the company in here. We were doing it more reactively off of the videos. I started, I, when I bought, I had, when I woke up that morning, I had no intention of buying a building. I didn't even know how to buy a building. Shit, I still don't know how to buy a building. 
I, Did you buy this as raw land? No. So we bought this as an abandoned building. How long was this vacant for? It was 20 years. years. Yeah. It used to be a nightclub. Like they had hair bands and country oh. bands, and it was a <clears throat> cowboy bar. There's wood wood slats that they'd cut off of the property of poplar that was just put up wet and twisted. Uh, there was no power in the building. The doors were welded shut. And one day we had driven past here 10 years on the way to the gym, and it was open, and we just happened to drive up. And I, we found a number, we called some people, we got a hold of the lady, and I'm like, how much do you want for this place? She's like, 190. I'm like, I'll give you 120. She's like, I don't know, let me talk to my husband. She came back, said 160. I'm like, I'll give you 140. She's like, you bought a building. I didn't have $1,200. So my guy, my buddy's like, hey, let's go talk to the, the guy at the bank. And I said, hey, I want to buy this building. He's like, don't you have some cars? I'm like, yeah. He goes, okay, give me a title to these cars, and you know, I'll give you a loan for the building. So boom, we got the building. Come to see my building, my doors are welded shut. Yeah. The lady shuts up. We cut the welds off, come inside. And we just start. It's it, Amanda described it about six months ago, and I never had a word for it until then. I said, you know, I'm kind of bored. I want to buy a giant, huge factory. Mm -hmm. And people are like, what do you, I don't know what I want to do with it. And Amanda's like, it's the Wonder Woman. You need the wonderment. You're bored because there's no wonderment. And we fed off of the people when we were doing the build out on the building. When we went in the first time, it's just like, Huge building, 10,000 square feet. We're never going to fill this place up. We made it 16,000 and it's completely filled up. Yeah. And we would come over here after the contractors would leave and just come in the building and just like walk around and talk. And like, oh, this is different. And this is different. And the viewers, the audience were like, man, you should put in a spiral staircase. You should put in a fireman pole. You should put yeah. in a glass wall. And we just really did that. And they, we fed off of it. And because of that, we were able to run, you know, promotions and there was a lot of traffic on Facebook and we made a lot of money very quickly and easily yeah. off of that and kept feeding the project. And I, I'm very, I'm really curious if we could do it again in the same exact manner. I don't think anything gets done exactly the same, but I think you could do it again. Here's what I mean. I think there's, a, there's a 150,000 square foot building and they want $2 million for it. What are what would payments be? Sixteen grand a month, you think? Yeah. About that. I wonder if we could generate just off of the content and the interest. If we could generate sixteen thousand dollars a month to pay the mortgage on this, and then put a couple of I don't I don't know how we do it. So where's the building? I don't even know. Four hours from McMinnville. That's where he's at. It's in Tennessee. Yeah. But I'm. It's the excitement of that. That's yeah. what's exciting. Not the finished product. I don't even care about it. I don't want it to finish. I don't ever yeah. want to be done with it. That's the excitement. Yeah. And that's what excited everybody that was around us. So when we came here, the building was, it was gutted, but we said, hey, we're going to have a, we're going to have my birthday party at the building, at the new building. And we didn't know what that looked like. Mm -hmm. And how many, were you here when Little White was here? Yeah. And we had 400 people show up, people we never met. Cool. Just come in. I mean, we do a party. What was a big party that you actually saw? Two food trucks line out the door. A thousand? Yeah. Packed. Shoulder to shoulder in the building. And there's nothing what in was here. I would guess there was under 300 here at this event this time. Yeah, it was smaller. So we had a thousand people just show up unannounced, like, hey, we're having a party. Come. Yeah. And they came from everywhere Japan, Norway, Finland, Sweden, Germany. Yeah. Just to come to the party. That's bizarre. I don't know if it is. You asked the question earlier on how is he in business for so long or whatever. You kind of asked that question, right? Like, how has he been so successful for so long? Yeah. Well, if without money, structure or something. Yeah, like if that. money is the success metric for most businesses, and you are a self-proclaimed terrible with finances, then how do you? Oh, I'm horrible with finances. Like, how do you keep running? Yeah. It's. You will never meet another person that thrives in chaos better than him. Yeah. And I mean that in the, like, you could, everything, if it's calm and everything's great, he's, he's off. If there's chaos and there's energy to feed off of and just, we need to react immediately, mm -hmm. that's, that's how he survives. That's how he thrives. Are you afraid of being bored? I don't know what to do when I don't have something to do. I mean, I don't stand, I can't stand around in a group of people mm -hmm. and have a conversation that's not going to be beneficial. Do the conversations that you have, like, 
here with podcasts and the conversations you've had at events like SRF, do you find those to be beneficial? Most of them. I mean, you can see it. Like, we yeah. recorded some content today that went nowhere. Mm. And when I walked out, they're like, the fuck was that? <laughs> and they're like, he wasn't interested in it. Like, I heard about this after the fact. Sure. I don't even remember who it was, but... Uh, what is your take on rest, then? If you're, if you Sleep don't... Sleep faster. <laughs> I don't have a day of rest. No, that was part like, of me, like going, rest going, in general. Going to the ruckus, it was a problem for me because I had to be there. On, I was only going to be able to be there Saturday. Oh. We couldn't do any sales on Saturday or yep. do anything on Saturday. Um, rest in general, I don't. I, don't, I go to bed at ten thirty. I, I go to bed at ten thirty. Mm-hmm. Typically, I want to have my head on the pillow and it lights off by eleven thirty, but it's usually twelve or twelve thirty. Okay. And then I wake right up at 4.30. I was awake at 4.30 this morning. Yeah. Yesterday, I was awake at 4.30. Uh, looked at the clock. And I'm like, man, I probably should have a couple hours more sleep, right? So mm-hmm. I got up at 6.30. And I was completely off my game all day yesterday. Yeah. And it's because I didn't get up at 4.30. You threw off your routine. Yeah. But do you find certain activities to be restful? I'm at peace with it. Yeah, yeah. So if so, like sewing is so probably got, yeah. Relaxing. Okay, so I was going to say that, right? Because for me, rest is not like a lot of people will say oh, it's restful, I'm going to sit and like binge watch my favorite TV show, or I'm going to go lay out on the beach, or like whatever is restful. That's not restful for me. That causes me anxiety. Yeah. But there are activities that I find to be restful. They don't need to be income producing. Your sewing is income producing for you, but it doesn't have to be, depending on what you're, what you're doing. But there are certain like tasks that are that bring me peace, that bring me rest, what does that look like for you? So you're absolutely right, right? So people are constantly, I love when they tell me I don't have time. I'm like, Game of Thrones, I'm like, Game of Thrones, what's your favorite season? They always have an answer or something. I'm like, so you <laughs> have time for TV, it. but you don't have time for success, right? Yeah. And I give them shit for it, but I mm-hmm. do the same thing myself. I am on a sewing machine Yeah. while I'm listening to and kind of watching whatever it yep. is, right? And it's generally content. And that's even like Bear or The Brief or whatever. When yeah. I do a podcast, like the Pulling the Thread podcast, I've typically listened to Bear. I've listened to some Tim Pool. I've listened to some current events. And that's what we're going to talk about. Yeah. I so listen I to Pulling excuse. the Thread while I'm painting houses. So I have an excuse. It's not okay for you, but I have an excuse to do it because I'm working because while I'm doing it. Yeah. But you wouldn't be able to sit and watch that stuff most likely if you weren't doing something with your no, hands. No, absolutely. I, you if wouldn't I, watch so it. So have you seen upstairs? No. I have these giant couches. I have an 80 some inch TV on the wall. It's been turned on maybe five times in the building. Anytime I sit on the couches for more than a couple, unless there's a bunch of people, I fall asleep immediately under five minutes. Are you sleep deprived or is that just how you run? Oh, I'm probably sleep deprived. Okay. I mean, and it's how I run. I, I mean, there's a few movies I can, I couldn't tell you one of them, but I, I do recall, like I say, I'm like, man, I actually watched that entire movie. It's sure. that good. Um, when I get in a vehicle, if I have a laptop in my lap, I've got a phone. Amanda drives everywhere we go on the weekends yeah. and, so that I can do that. If I'm not doing that, I'm asleep. That's interesting. And do you think, like, if you were to sleep more, would that stop? Oh, I don't think so. Don't think so? You should just out with yeah, I don't think so. I need so much more sleep than you, but I'm also so jealous of that ability. <laughs> I don't know that I could always do it because when I was younger, I'd sleep, you know, half a day and stuff. Yeah. I remember Grandpa getting up, and, and you know, old people, they're always at Walmart, they're at McDonald's at 4.30 in the morning solving the world's problems. Yeah. Well, they didn't, I don't think they went to bed. I remember my grandfather going to bed at maybe 9, 10 o'clock, maybe. Yeah. But he was always gone when I would wake up, so. Oh, I, yeah. Early runners. Yeah, maybe. I think it's as you get older, you need less sleep. Maybe. I run very high testosterone. I use a, you know, a lot of testosterone. Yeah. You also work out every day, don't you? Very little. Less than, much less than, yes, but less than you think. I don't work out like that guy works out. Oh, well, that guy probably works out a lot. I, and I, I, and that wasn't really on my radar either. Brad Lee, do you know who that is? Mm-mm. Dropping bombs with Brad Lee. He had, uh, maybe it was Brecca, one of the performance doctors, you know, guys on. And uh, he's like, you need eight hours of sleep, you need six to eight hours. And Bradley goes, I get four and a half, I go to bed at you know, 12, I get up at 4.30, what would you say to that? And he's like, I'd say you're super high on testosterone. He's like, well, you're right. And I go, holy shit, there it is. So that, that's... You're just hijacking your brain into to requiring less sleep of you in order to operate. I don't know that... I, it's, it's optimization of sleep. When your yeah. hormones are optimized, it's economy of sleep. Sleep faster. Schwarzenegger's like, oh, well... 
you know, we all have 24 hours in the day. You uh, are at work. You don't actually work. You're at work for eight hours. You sleep for eight hours. You've got the other eight hours. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. So that I say, well, you've got two hours to work. Whoa, 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 whoa. I need an hour to sleep. No, sleep faster. You can do it with six. Yeah. You, and I think anybody can. For a while. I mean, there are times when I will sleep till two o'clock on a Saturday. Yeah. Maybe every five weeks. Recovery day. Just well, and, and typically, I'm going to use chemicals. If I want to sleep in in the morning, I'm going yeah. to take some chemicals to ensure that I went to. And I say chemicals, it's, you know, valerian root, sleep aid, yeah. whatever. But I'll take those so that I intentionally sleep. sleep but longer. but even then, I still look at the clock and it's 4.30. Well, when you build into your life a rhythm, it is harder to break that rhythm, right? And that's that's what gets stuff done for me. Like, I wake up and I do the exact same thing every morning in the same way. And I do the same thing in the evening. Like, I have an hour at the end of my day and I follow the same rhythm pretty much every single day. Like, the same set of tasks gets executed on, the same, like, series of things happens. And, and that's what de-escalates my body so that I can go to sleep. But it's also what gets me going in the morning, that same rhythm of, like, we wake up and we do this and then we do this and then we do this and that sets me on the foot of success and you screw up that rhythm and it throws off everything so you you throw off your wake up time you throw off everything mm -hmm. and then you're just off for the rest of the day i get that that yeah that tracks you set your clothes out tonight for tomorrow no but i yeah. this is what i look like every day I wear the Jeans, exact same t-shirt. Yeah. I have a very limited color spectrum, so everything matches. I don't care. Yeah, I get dressed in the dark. Yeah, so it I all wear, needs to match. My shoes are here. My pants are here. Fresh socks, fresh underwear are here. Yep. And a new sh I change shirts. I don't do laundry. It's very rare. A couple, I do laundry when I need socks, underwear, pants, but I put on a brand new shirt every day, and I never wear the same shirt, so that removes most of the laundry. That works. It's not like you don't have you know a couple thousand of them downstairs. Correct. So. Well, when they come in, so we, we do 120 pieces in addition to employees. Every employee, we give them a new design of the shirt, mm -hmm. and five come in for me. And then all of our, and then we have influencers also, so those get me held out. But I don't, I don't ever, so that's removed the bulk of the laundry. So Amanda washes very little laundry. Yeah, well, pants can and should be worn for four, five, six days. If you're not doing dirty farm stuff, then just put I have it back outside, on. but I change. Like I'll, yeah. every morning when I go outside, I put it on outside clothes, outside socks, outside shoes come in immediately and then I take a shower and put my clean clothes, clothes back on. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, your dogs like to lean on people and they smell. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> For sure. And you only saw one of them. I, she's, we have dubbed her uh, the Livestock Guardian Dog Ambassador because she's not scary enough to be an LGD. She does a good job, yeah. but she's over at the fence like, I just love you. I'm like, I just met you. That's this is not yeah. good. So she was raised by Bob. I think she was, the kids played with her a lot. Oh yeah, she's sweet. But people baby talk the dog. I'm like, oh, look, yeah. ignore the dog. Yeah. Ignore the dog. The dog was put in a pen up there in the corner and immediately jumped through the fence. The fence, the gate that she jumped through was the exact same gate down here. And so like, she's fully capable Oh, of that. absolutely. And that's the point. Like, don't, Ignore the dog. As soon as the dog gets out, she now ne you'll never keep her in. Right. My dogs have never seen the street. That's why we have all those gates. Yeah, because your dogs are the size of horses. Mm -hmm. It would end very badly if they got outside. Yeah. Of your well, gate. I mean, some of them bite. They bite people. Oh yeah. That's why they're. We have to lock them up. You're two like big, big dogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they look like they want to eat people. Yeah, they very much do. Have you ever had an incident where one of them has gotten too close to someone they shouldn't? No, and I've had an incident scared. where somebody that shouldn't be too close to the dogs has gotten too close to the dogs. Like, we, we lock them up. Like, we, you can't get to them. You have to go through a fence and go to a kennel. Yeah. And we're like, what's that girl doing up there? Or people, like, they think they're the dog whisperer and they're doing silly shit from movies. I'm like, look, that dog's going to really bite the shit out of I you. I hate the line, oh, I'm good with dogs. Yeah. No, you're not. Yeah. Yeah, I have a German Shepherd who doesn't much care for people. So. Yeah, and they're like, "Who you dog?" I'm like, "You're on my property." I'm pet your dog can I bring my Can I bring my dog? It's super trained. I'm like, "That's great." My dogs aren't. Yeah, that's a valid point. Yeah, your dogs are intentionally untrained. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't socialize. Them. Yeah. When you come past the first gate and you get to the second gate, I want you to be bit. Mm. Like they were not around employees. They they that big dog is is great with Amanda, myself, my son, his girlfriend, mm -hmm. but nobody else. 
do you let that dog out in like a parking lot area after you shut gates at night? We do, yeah. yeah. That's why you have the inside gate mm -hmm. and then you have the outside. It's a circle within a circle. Yeah. So we can have a different set of dogs. If you get to, if you knock on this door, mm -hmm. you've come past two fences. Like everything has completely changed. You're not a dude at just looking for gas or assistance. Yeah. Yeah, because you wouldn't be alive anymore if that dog's out. Makes sense. What's one thing? If you, so I, th I think you have a desire to turn around to the generation that's behind you and pull them up, but you want them to be pulling themselves up while you're at it. Like you'll take one hand if they're climbing with the other. What's one thing that you consistently tell everyone or that you wish you could tell everyone and they'd actually listen to you? Move with purpose and do everything. Here, okay, here's the real thing. Move with urgency. Move with purpose. Do everything you do as though it's important. If it's not important, stop doing it. That's what I would tell me. Mm -hmm. I'd tell me that 10 years ago. I'd tell me that 20 years ago. If I moved 20 years ago like I did the last 10 years, everything would be different for everybody. That you, It'd be different for you if I did something different 20 years ago. Do you think you'd still be doing things like Self-Reliance Festival, like the connecting with people type events that you do? Yeah, I think so. Because that's really, I think I'm better at that. Yeah. That's really, if you followed me around, you're like, man, you don't really do a lot of work. You do a lot of social media stuff. You just do a lot of walking. You're really hard to find. Six miles. Yeah. Every day inside the building. I'm not surprised. That's, that's a slow day. Move with urgency. Move with purpose. Do stuff that's important, and if it's not important, stop doing it. Mm -hmm. Solid. Yeah. The message for the last couple of years is like, okay, so all these kids these days, we always say it. Like, I remember Grandpa saying it. Yeah. And I remember, I don't, my father never said it, but people my father's age, kids these days, right? I feel like I say that. But that's our fault. I mean, any, any shortcomings of my children is my fault. My kids don't have any addiction. They're growing, they're buying properties. They're having children, right? Mm -hmm. But any, like, we made those people the way they are or yeah. allowed them to be. Yeah. Um, but how do we fix that, right? History is his story. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to tell your story. We do a lot of things here, and every now and then somebody will buck back and question it. Why are we doing this this way? Because it's the way I want the fucking story told three years from now when we're telling it. Yeah. Right? So who's going to tell those stories, right? We take our elderly people and we warehouse them, and then we pretend that we love them and care about them. Mm -hmm. And we put them someplace, and maybe we go see them occasionally. But what if you moved enough right now and did enough that you could make enough money that you had a piece of property whether it's one acre five acres ten acres it doesn't have to be under one roof we've convinced people in this world that you have to have a 2500 square foot house with 2.5 bathrooms and you've got your wife who also works a job and you guys don't really know each other and then you send your two and a half kids somewhere else for somebody else to raise them mm -hmm. so what if we had smaller houses we used to call them you know mother-in-law flats or whatever what if we kept our parents on the property and they helped you raise your kids so that you didn't have to send your kids to be raised by somebody who hates your way of life, right? We send people to public school. Most public school teachers don't have kids. They have your kids. Mm -hmm. And if you really talk to them, they don't like anything about you. And you definitely don't like what they're doing. So why do we let them raise our children for more of the children's life than we actually have involved in the child? So what if we had the ability to keep that on a property? And then what if you built other properties around that where those families have those same values? with that village, that tribe, whatever it is, right? What if my neighbor believed the same thing, which he does? Mm -hmm. And then what if my parents were here and helped raise our kids? Or that's me and Amanda at this point. What if our kids were here and we helped raise those grandchildren? But will those kids perform? And the truth is right now, no, they won't. And that's, that's my shortcoming. That's my fault, right? My son, he worked within the business and he didn't perform like I thought he did, and I'm sure he has his version of the story. And he's now got a job way, making way more money than I could have paid him or would have paid him. Sure. But I think he'll be back. Probably. Sooner than later. I mean, he's making a lot of money. They're working in 80 hours a week, though. Yeah. And I say working him. He, he loves it. And he's married. No. No. Girlfriend? No, not now. Yeah, he'll be back when he wants to spend more he time. He lives here now. He's on the property. Yeah. But I don't know how to make that happen right i don't know how to put him in there and he's like you'll never give me this and you don't let me change things i'm like we'll change it and i don't i don't know i i, I think that i i think that i failed a lot of ways 
parenting my my children. Mm. Did you raise your kids primarily when you were in California? Like, were they in their teens when you left, or how old were they? When no, they you were left? here. They, they were, were here. here. We came here. They were probably six or, or oldest. You know, we're six and seven. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So they spent most of their growing up in. Oh yeah, Tennessee. they worked. They saw us work. They worked in the business and. We like when you invited me somewhere. You invited my wife and our kids. We yeah. were never going. Like I don't like I don't let people watch my dogs. Much less my kids. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I, I mean, you really only parent kids once, right? I have no experience in that. But looking backwards, I'm like my my parents got one shot. Like I'm the oldest child, and I was the guinea pig. Do you and think they feel like they succeeded? I think that they know that they did the best that they could with what they had where they were at. I think we all know that everybody falls on their face in some regard or another. Do you think they succeeded? I think so. My dad was talking the other day um, about like the transition and Logan and I moving to Oklahoma and he was like how do you put it? He was describing me to someone else and I was standing next to him. He's like, this is the kid that I really thought was going to have me working for forever to pay for law school and then a doctorate and then something else. And here she is and she makes more money than I do and she does construction and she doesn't use the college degree we made her get. I was like, yeah, I really don't use the college degree you made me get, which they didn't. Um, My parents are both college graduates and I was strongly encouraged and I went for a while and it's just. I don't want to sit behind a desk. Like, yeah. I just don't. Evan from Radio Made Easy. Yeah. Started his company maybe one year ago. Mm-hmm. And he called his dad and he said, I made $120,000 this month. Yeah. And his dad said, but what about medical insurance? I love that question. Because we were both W-2 employees, I don't know, two and a half years ago. We were both working, you know, separate jobs. It, we were employed by other people. And we paid for our own health insurance then. And we pay the exact same now. And people, yeah, that was our response when we told people, like, Logan's on the on the downhill. Like, he's ready to go out. And they're like, what are you going to do about benefits? What are you going to do about health insurance? My health insurance premium is not going to change. I'm going to pay the exact same I paid last month. I'm still going to have my own, like, accident fund set aside. I'm going to still do disability insurance because one of us is going to fall off a roof at some point and we're going to need it. And... Hopefully it's me and not him because I'll cope better. <laughs> but man, I hate that. I hate that response. It was his sister. She's like complaining about what I don't remember even what it was, but he's like, "What are you making? Leave your job at sixty-three grand a year." I think it was sixty-three. He's like, "I'll pay sixty-two thousand to ship." Yeah. And then you don't want to do that because it's what? Because you're ten ninety-nine? Because you're self-employed? Because I don't know. I think if people tasted freedom. And realize that they don't have to like punch a clock. They don't want it. They like that. It's so they're I still hate, slaves. I hate that they don't want it. Yeah, they don't. That's the world wouldn't shiny. turn like it does. It's the shiny. world wouldn't turn like it does. No, it would turn better it would if turn people worse. figured it out and wanted that. It would turn worse. It would turn worse if people had the attitude that they have now. Nah, the the dead wood would die. Ooh. The people that it's that it's Atlas shrugged. The performers leave. Let them eat each other. We continue to live our lives and do business with each other. Mm. She has something I need. I have something she needs. We trade those items and those people no longer exist. The problem is the government and the manipulation and the prodding. And they would send them this way to, you know, we're the bad guys. Their their problems are our fault. It's not the government's fault. I've gotten to the point where being around here a lot, we, we talk different conversations similar that you would probably have with them and stuff like that. But when, like, or maybe I've just gotten jaded and just accepted the fact that, like, you need busy worker bees and just let busy worker bees live their busy worker bee life. Let them remain slaves. It occupies them, and we don't have to deal with them at that point. And in certain circumstances, we need employees. That's what I'm saying. Like... I tell my employees. Like, I... Hey, turn your sewing machines on, and we'll have the conversation. They don't listen. Every now and then, one. One does. Yeah. Hey, buy Bitcoin. Like, buy Bitcoin. If you'd have put your $1,400, you'd have $68,000 right now. Yeah. 
And I tell them, I'm like, hey, remember when I told you to buy Bitcoin? Every now and then, no, one listens. The light's going. People come on the live feed, they're like, what should I buy? You shouldn't buy anything. I'd rather see you. Let's, let's identify that thing. You work all week. And you have that little bit of money after your bills are paid. What do you do with that money? Where does that money go? Or do you save it for four weeks to be able to do something better? What is that? Let's identify that thing that you love. It was important enough to put in that entire month's worth of work to be able to do this thing. What is that? Let's identify that and then figure out how to monetize that, right? Can we show that? Can we build social media off of that? Can you bring that in? Can you co-brand it? Whatever that is. Let's identify that thing. Build something super cool. And then let's do some business where we brand it. That's the answer. If you have to ask, what I'm a terrible salesperson horrible at, at representing my product what should i buy you shouldn't fucking buy anything and yet you sell things every single day pushing them away yeah most powerful word is no yeah is that why you have such a big lead time no it's because i'm willing to sell things that we don't have that's probably it's probably me when bear talks about everything we have we actually have been and it's ready to ship i don't Right, but you do have a lot of product. We like, absolutely do. on the shelves, mm -hmm. and I'm assuming that that's not like no, it's not somebody else's shit. It, well, it, that's not lead time stuff, right? Like if I go in and buy, like you have a lot of the little duffel bags and that sort of stuff. Like you're not putting a whatever your lead time is on like your more intricate like chest rates and that sort of thing. So most people order, and it says eight to twelve weeks. Yeah, eighty percent of our stuff ship on the next day. Yeah. Even though it says 8 to 12. Weeks. So that's just your, like, cover my... That's the default. It's really because it's held over from the beginning of website. Sure. But that covers us. Some stuff yeah. is. We'll do promotions and, they're like, like, we'll do big promotions Black Friday or whatever. And, like, I really wish I could buy this thing. I'm like, well, I'll open the website up. You can buy it. But I don't, I don't know. It used to say no ETA. Like, we have no idea when we're going to ship this. We'll open it up. You can order it at this 20% discount. And... Like we did, we did a million dollars on a, on a three, four day Black Friday weekend. We had products that were out there for two years, open orders. They complain we refund them. Yeah. We still made. 80% don't. It always ships. Yeah. You'll get it when you get it mentality. Kind of. I mean, they talk about it, right? Yeah. There's no such thing as bad publicity and the guy talking bad draws so many more people to us. And they're just curious. Like, they used to call us a cult all the time. Yeah, I can see that, like, from an outside perspective. That just because sense. when a guy's on the internet, I don't have to fight those fights anymore. Like, I used to love Facebook fighting. Hey, we got a live one, no, man. We made, we it. would make a lot of money Facebook fighting. A lot of money. when we do Because you drive sales. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I don't, I don't have to fight those fights anymore. And the reason they'd say cult is because some dude would say something, and a hundred people would show up and go, Hey, I just ordered. Here's my thing. Mm -hmm. Like they just loved it, and it drove traffic, and it spurred sales. Yeah, Reddit doesn't like you. Yeah, I check one, people on New York like, Times likes me. That's cool. I mean, that article was pretty good. I think that was in my favor, talking about exactly how I do business and talking about the same conversation we just had. Yeah. But how many pages is Reddit? I don't know. I like to search people when I'm going to their properties and just see what's out there. Mm -hmm. And currently your top Reddit article is, he just sells outdated chest rigs. Like, you're such an idiot. I do sell outdated chest rigs. Do you know how much I get for them? No. Those rigs on those mannequins in there? Yeah. $1,000 a piece. Impressive. The guys beg to buy them. That's crazy. You, even in Splatter? You, oh, more in Splatter. Like, when we opened up Splatter, I'll bet we just did sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 in Splatter. It's insane. Especially splatter, and that's what they're they're inflamed about the it, splatter. It's just it's so entertaining to me. Like, not that I'm tactical at all ever in any direction, but you think chest rig. I don't know, green tan camo, hundred percent neutral, and then it's like, hey, I just played paintball in this. Like that's what it looks like. So here's here's the deal, not the splatter, right? But like. Guys are constantly like, how do I get my wife involved, right? How do I get my wife to go shoot or whatever? Well, she has to have one on her street. Yeah. So you have to not linger over the top of her and be like, you're doing it wrong. Dudes are like, hey, well, well, I, your husband can't teach you to shoot. I couldn't teach Amanda something, right? I could teach her. I could send her to another dude who's going to tell her the exact same curriculum, the same words, and she will listen to him, but not to me. 
Probably. So, but the whole thing, like the ownership thing, like guys are like, I bought my wife a bow. I'm like, cool, what's it look like? Oh, it looks just like yours. You bought you a bow. But when the bow industry, when the archery industry came out and started really branding female stuff with turquoise and, and pink and stuff, we did the same thing. I don't know that it was, it wasn't because of them, but when we put pink thread into gear, that was definitely her gear. There was no question. And when he bought it for her, it was okay for him to buy something for himself. So not only did he buy something for her, he bought even more for himself. So the sales just continued to grow. And we do pink thread, orange thread, toxic green thread, Tiffany blue thread. We do all that stuff. And nobody, we were probably the only people doing it for 10 years. You see other people try to do it, but you have to be very, very skilled to put contrast thread on something because it really amplifies when it's crooked. Yeah. And there's a ton of dudes out there making complete horseshit with the colored thread and you really see their inability to sew straight. That's a really good point. And then if we build it custom, we over sew it two to three times so it pops. So not only do you have to track once, you gotta do it two and three Repeatedly times. Repeatedly in the exact same way. That's right. That's cool. We literally build the thing and then sew it back all over and make the colored thread. Do you build it the original time with the colored thread? No. You we, underlay it in black. I do I do it with it if I'm doing something custom or something. Yeah. But no, we don't do that anymore. We sew it with black and then come back over it with the color thread. And use it almost like a highlighter. Uh huh. That's cool. I don't know how to sew like, at all. You could though. Okay. If you wanted to, I have no doubt you would. I had twenty people come up to me, ask me about selling, and I'm like, look, what you the first thing I'm like, what have you made? Show me something you made. Well, I haven't I don't have a sewing machine. So so, so I have a sewing machine, so you, I just don't right, care. Right, So you don't want to sew. Okay, got it. What's your URL? What's your what's your social medias? Well, I, I'm working on it. No, you're not fucking work. Like, no, it takes 38 seconds to open an Instagram account. Yeah, like people pay thousands of dollars to come here for half a day to talk and sew or do whatever. I'll give you everything for free. Show me that you set up the, the social medias, right? It'll take you less than two hours. I saw six, seven of those dudes today. I'm like, what's your social media? Walking in. Hey, what's your social media? I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna do it. You haven't done it yet. I'm out of questions for you. All right. <laughs> I appreciate the time, though. It's been cool to like actually hear from you. When you walk out of here, what are you going to wish that I had asked you? Okay. Not anything. All right. Solid conversation. Do we want to send people to you? you? You're not looking for more business. I'm not looking for more business. They can follow me. I'm on Instagram at Lamp Post Collective. Why Lamp Post, why Lamp Post Collective? You read the Chronicles of Narnia? Mm-hmm. So the Lamp Post is what they see when they first walk through the wardrobe. It's the first like highlight point when they enter this realm of imagination, of different, of mystery, of more. It's also the thing that brings them back to reality. And they spend their decades and they become like the kings and the queens and they spend all of that time there and they're riding in the woods and the thing that brings them back into the real world is they find the lamppost again and they follow that trail back and they reground themselves and they put their feet back. It always draws them back together. And that's what we want to do is we want to be this highlight point, this beacon of are we bringing people together? Is our outcome going to be that people are together and that they're seeing more than what's right in front of them. Are you seeing just like your reality and that's your box and then you're done? Or are you seeing more than that? Are you looking into, like you said, the wonderment, the, the more than the out there. Um, did you know that on your own? Like, did you know that? Or did you know that because you wrote a thesis or a term paper on it? Or did somebody point that out? Like you just knew that like when you read the, the books, I just picked it up. I love like the Narnia series has been one of my, favorite book series since I was really little um and that like that symbolism of that anchor point that and it shows up in the other books too that the lamppost shows up in all of the books in different places or that light beacon and it traces back to like where are you fixing your focus are you fixing it on the dark on the bad on the stuff that's going to weigh you down on the stuff that's going to break you are you fixing your focus on the light on the thing you want to make different, on the thing that's going to be better, on the thing that's ahead of you. Are you looking backwards? You're going to fall down if you're looking backwards. Like, don't look at the bear while it's chasing you. Just run. And I just want to look at the light. Like, I want to look forward. And I want to move forward. And I want to keep my feet underneath me while I'm doing it. 
Mm. And I want to collect people that want to do that. That's good. That's good. Do you know what nine and three quarters is? Yeah. Okay. Right, so. 